You know what? I've been around for a while. I've traveled the world, met some interesting people, done some crazy things. So you might just think there's not much that could take me by surprise. You'd be wrong. The world is full of stories and science and things that amaze and confound me every single day. Incredible mysteries that keep me awake at night. Some I can answer. Others just defy logic. Like in Death Valley, where rocks seem to be moving across the desert under their own steam. Is there an explanation? Or the strange, unexplained lights spotted in the mountains of North Carolina? Are they the ghosts of Native American warriors? And a secret tribe is redefining the limits of human endurance. They can run 400 miles in one race. Are they superhuman? Yep. It's a weird world. And I love it. You know, there are some things that we all depend on that really don't get enough credit. I mean, where would we be without the humble rock? Think about it. The Earth's outer layer, the very ground under our feet is made of rock. This was mankind's first technology. Since the Stone Age, the entire history of human advancement can be traced back to this little guy. We've used rock as tools, as material, to build our civilizations. We've mined rock for the precious metals inside. Without rock, there would be no modern world. In short, rocks rock. Death Valley, California. Here, in a harsh, hot, and deadly terrain, mysterious natural forces are at work. Rocks appear to be moving around totally independently, on perfectly flat ground. This strange and seemingly impossible phenomenon has defied explanation for more than 60 years. Now, Weird or What is going to put an incredible new theory to the test. The mystery unfolds 3,600 feet above sea level in a three-mile-long dry lake bed known as the Racetrack Playa. Surrounded by mountains, the playa is home to hundreds of dolomite fragments, from tiny pebbles to 700-pound boulders, all of which cruise across this level surface in all directions, covering distances of up to a mile, leaving behind a telltale winding trail in the dirt. Park ranger Bob Greenberg knows the rocks on his watch are moving around but neither he nor anyone has ever actually seen it happen. Well, people have tried to stay out. The weather's too harsh. Uh, they can't deal with the high wind, 100 mile an hour wind plus. It gets pretty cold out there. One reason we know before we had today's technologies, they moved, there was a study done where they actually went out and put pegs next to particular rocks, and they'd come out periodically and see if it had moved. But uh, more recently, we've put video cameras out, and either the weather kills them or someone has taken them. But questions remain. How fast do they move? How often? How can supposedly inanimate objects be moving at all? Over the years, there have been plenty of wild theories, and Ranger Greenberg has heard them all. There's stories. Why do the rocks move? Uh, I've heard leprechauns, which I find entertaining. Uh, some people accuse the rangers of going out and pushing them around. Oh boy, we don't do that, no? Yeah, I guess possibly someone could go out there and create a hoax, but they'd have to be pretty driven to do that. I think this is graffiti. Someone has made a figure eight, probably with this rock. And, uh, I'm going to guess this one's graffiti. Crazy explanations aside, there's no denying there's a genuine mystery afoot here. 
Stones that weigh anywhere from seven to 700 pounds are sailing across a dry desert floor and no one has ever seen it happen. Is that weird or, or what? So, what's going on here? Geologist Dr. Paula Messina has spent years studying the stones of racetrack playa and theorizing how they might be moving. She believes the answer could lie with Death Valley's strange wind patterns. The playa itself is like a mosaic of microclimates that we find that wind speed in one location is, can be as much as six times greater as in another location. And I've measured the wind simultaneously at different spots to know that this is true. So rocks that are fairly close to one another will do totally different things because the nature of the wind is different at different parts of the playa. These super localized winds can reach up to 90 miles an hour. Due to the valley's unique narrow canyons and mountain passes that constrict the wind flow, causing it to accelerate dramatically. Air is a fluid, and there are certain rules that fluids live by. And one of them is when you constrict the flow of a fluid, it speeds up. It's a little bit like putting your finger at the end of a garden hose. The water will spray out a lot faster when you do that than when you just leave the hose going. And in the racetrack, there are two topographic corridors. They're notches. They're, they're like mountain passes. And air comes from the west to the east in the predominant motion out here in the southwest. And it's coming up from a place called Saline Valley. But it has to go through one or two of these very narrow canyons in order to get to the racetrack. So I think that the air is moving very fast when it gets through those two notches and that amplifies the wind speed on the racetrack. So even though we may be recording winds in the area that may be only 50 mile an hour gusts, at the racetrack it's significantly higher. So could this garden hose theory solve the mystery of the sailing stone? Are the rocks of the racetrack playa being subjected to some kind of natural wind tunnel? The theory has never been tested. Until now. Hmm, okay. Maybe I should leave this to the professional. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Bruce Barham is a science teacher with a passion for stones. Well, that's a keeper. And especially the sailing stones. Barham has been chasing the wind theory for years. Now he's ready to put it to the test by attempting to recreate the atmospheric conditions of Death Valley in a wind tunnel. It seemed like just a logical explanation to me to take what we think happens in nature and test it on a smaller scale. Barman can't bring a perfectly calibrated wind tunnel to the playa, so he brought the playa to the wind tunnel. This is a mixture of sand and clay. We spread it out last night on the, on the test bed, and then as the moisture evaporated out of this, the clay dried out and it, it fractured. When you go out on the playa, this is exactly what it looks like. The clay is all broken up in these little pieces and little sections, all fragmented. This is a perfect representation of what the playa looks like. Having created the perfectly flat, dry and cracked conditions of the playa, Barman adds the rocks, five of them, ranging from one to 20 pounds. So let's go ahead and turn this baby on and let's slide some rocks. We'll rock and roll. So what's our velocity now? We're at 50. Anybody see anything moving? <laughs> there goes one. 60, there goes rock number one rolling off. <laughs> Even with winds of over 70 miles an hour, the experiment is inconclusive. The stones roll, but they need to slide to create the distinctive tracks. And the only rocks that move are small. The biggest rocks? like those on the playa, refuse to budge. 
So even with winds over 70 miles an hour, the experiment is a blustery bust. The stones just don't sail. My experiment isn't working too well either. There's something missing here. But what could it be? Back on the ply era, Ranger Bob thinks he has the answer. You need rocks, wind, and some kind of lubricant. A dusty desert valley seemingly offers little in the way of lubricant, but when the seasons change, so does the playa. Here we are in the winter, and the temperature is very cold, and in fact, um, it's been raining. So even though this place gets only about two inches of rain a year, we're seeing a significant event in terms of the weather in Death Valley right now. And with these rains, the usually dry lake bed becomes a shallow lake once again. So Barman brings in another variable, water. So what we're doing now is we've tried to simulate uh, the flooding conditions on the playa. With a small amount of water, the stones begin to move. Look at rock one. Yeah, there it goes. There it goes two. Two is starting to slide. And so is four. There goes four. Yep. We got two and four to slide at 70 miles an hour. We've kind of peaked now. Even after adding water to the mix, the wind theory is looking doubtful. But in the most bizarre way, the extreme conditions in Death Valley could yet provide the answer. In winter, the playa's nighttime temperature drops from searing to freezing. Any water on the valley floor soon turns to ice. This fact combined with an afternoon watching winter sports may have led Dr. Messina to the answer. I saw curling for the first time in one of the Winter Olympics a few years ago. It was one of those eureka moments. I thought about the rocks. I thought about, gee, this is really interesting to see how little force it takes to get something to move when there's almost no friction. As a Canadian, I consider myself somewhat an authority on winter sports, so let's think about the marvelous mechanics of curling. A 40-pound granite rock is pushed down the ice at a target. The weight of the stone and the force applied melts just enough ice under the rock to reduce the friction to practically nothing, allowing the rock to skim across the ice at the nearest fork. So could the sailing stones of Death Valley be acting in a similar way? Could the science behind an Olympic sport explain this mystery? Back at the wind tunnel, it's time for one last try. Berman lowers the friction by turning the cracked surface of his mini playa into a makeshift curling rig. What we're trying to simulate here is that the playa has flooded and it's been wet for several days with a shallow lake. And then on the rare occasion, it froze. So we have a frozen solid surface. I'm gonna go ahead and get this wet with a layer of water which simulates this rare occurrence on the playa that happens with a shallow lake, freezing temperatures, frozen solid surface with a thin layer of water on it and we're going to test this again just this way. 40, 45. There it goes one. one. Yeah, one at 45. There goes rock three. There goes rock Sliding. three. 53, 54. Oh, perfect. <laughs> beautiful. Oh, beautiful. Oh, really nice. With a thin, slippery coat of mud now covering the ice below, the rocks sail along gracefully when hit with wind speeds known to exist in Death Valley, leaving trails in the mud identical to the ones on the playa. This shows that if the right conditions exist in nature and all of these different components come together in the right proportions, it works, it happens. It's a logical explanation, it's not a mystery. This is science, this is what it's about. But a mystery remains. Some trails are so twisty that even wind tunnels can't explain their erratic paths. And the stones are just as active in the summer when there is no ice to help them sail. 
I don't want to get too philosophical, but it's like, yeah, there's always going to be a mystery. And, and, and when there are no mysteries, life is going to be boring, right? So, I mean, it's great that we don't have all the answers. Our planet is a truly mysterious place filled with many phenomena that we simply cannot explain. In the USA, the hills of North Carolina are home to one such extraordinary mystery. Look at that. Oh, look at it. Look at it moving. Look at it moving down. It's going yeah. down the ridge. It's, it's heading down. Oh, my God. That is smoking. Look at that. It's in the mountain. Spooky, glowing orbs that regularly rise above the mountains and disappear into the horizon. Are these weird lights UFOs, ghosts, or even better, interdimensional beings? Let's see if we can get to the bottom of this. Northwest of Hickory, North Carolina lies Brown Mountain, a one and a half mile long ridge on the Pisgah National Forest. Its appearance belies a strange history. The first recorded sighting of mysterious lights was reported in 1771. People have been seeing them ever since. Oh yeah, well, they're, 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 they're yeah, wild, yeah, see? Yeah, there it goes. Paranormal investigator Joshua Warren grew up watching the mountain's strange light show. I first saw the lights when I was 12 or 13 years old. I was quite young. And I got really lucky, actually, because my parents took me and my sister up to the Overlook to finally see if we could catch a glimpse of these fabled illuminations. So we were sitting at the Overlook, and all of a sudden, this dark mountain in front of us lit up with a red, flaring light. And that light expanded, and then it dwindled, twinkled. And uh, I was amazed, because I knew that there was not supposed to be anything commercial or artificial on that mountain that could produce that kind of light. And yet, there it was. And that inspired me to discover what was happening there. Joshua has captured this remarkable phenomenon on film many times. I've got like six or eight of them all lined up across here, folks. Yeah. God almighty. See, yeah. See them all? Wow. Yeah. Oh, yes. man. That, for me, was so clear, I realized there is something real happening at Brown Mountain. Joshua has devoted his life to researching the Brown Mountain lights, and now he thinks he's discovered the truth. Until now, there have been hundreds of competing theories. Many believe the lights are produced by UFOs, the glowing orbs, perhaps, being some kind of alien vehicle or probe. Local resident Missy Hill has a different explanation. I believe that the Brown Mountain Lights is a spiritually charged area. It's the spirits of, of the dead is what people are seeing. I believe it's probably what's called an imprint, which means something is played over and over again. It's not the same as a being manifesting. It's more of... Uh, just like a tape playing over and over. Legend has it that back in the year 1200, Brown Mountain was the site of a bloody war between two Indian tribes. The death toll was huge, and it was said the heartbroken spirits of the warriors' wives still wander the mountain with lights, looking for the remains of their slain husbands. <laughs> Brown Mountain isn't the only place where strange lights appear. In central Norway, strange oblong lights have been appearing over the Hesdalen Valley since the 1980s. Southeast of Marfa, Texas, unexplained lights have been reported for 200 years. Hovering balls of light seem to float above the ground, sometimes for up to hours on end. So what's going on? 
Are people seeing ghosts? Or can science unravel a very real mystery that has endured for hundreds of years? Ghostly wanderings aside, could there be a more run-of-the-mill explanation for the Brown Mountain Lights? In 1913, the U.S. Geological Survey proclaimed the lights were train headlights from a nearby valley. Sounds plausible. However, three years later, a great flood swept through that valley and temporarily took out the railroad bridges, the roads, and all the power to the area. And guess what? The mysterious lights continue to appear above Brown Mountain. So can modern science find an answer to this enduring mystery? Well, it seems there are multiple explanations, including swamp gas or reflected starlight. Dan Caton, an astrophysicist who has studied the phenomena, also has a theory. I got a lot of emails from people who had seen them, and what was particularly interesting were people who reported seeing them from several feet away. So this is not going to be a distance at which you're going to confuse things. And then I began to think that this sounded a whole lot like the reports of ball lightning. An extremely rare phenomenon never successfully captured on film. Ball lightning is a luminous orb that can be as large as a soccer ball and can hover above the ground or move around wildly for several seconds. It has been observed occurring just before or after a lightning strike. We don't understand ball lightning, but it has been reported for centuries and seems to be real. Now, there's just one problem with this theory. Most sightings of the Brown Mountain Lights occur on clear, dry nights. No thunderstorms means no ball lightning. This is where Joshua Warren's theory comes in. He thinks the Brown Mountain Lights are similar to ball lightning, but without the lightning. We've been able to reproduce a similar phenomenon on a miniature scale in our lab. Now, as you can see, the stream of carbon that's floating up in the smoke has ignited this ball of plasma at the top of the jar. Well, it's easy enough in the lab, but to produce the effect in nature requires a source of energy, energy that Joshua believes is coming from Brown Mountain itself. And we're trying to measure any kind of strange electromagnetic interference that might be produced by the anomalous lights, just to see if they will create some type of interference that, say, a conventional light, maybe from a campfire or a lantern, would not produce. Just for some radio microwaves. Gotcha. Joshua claims to have detected erratic surges in the natural levels of electrical current running through the ground. And we think that could be because the mountain stores up electricity over time and then discharges it. These discharges intersect at various angles that all come together to create what looks like a ball of light. According to Joshua, Brown Mountain could be acting like a giant electrical capacitor, storing a constant trickle of static electricity between its rock strata and then discharging it quickly in very large bursts, bursts strong enough to turn the air into a plasma. Plasma is a super excited form of ionized gas that has released its electrons. Our sun is a massive ball of plasma. And closer to home, plasma is used to light up fluorescent tubes and flat screen plasma TVs. Joshua has designed an experiment, he says, proves the brown mountain lights are plasma balls caused by the mountain itself. So we have a special plasma tube that we have created to try to reproduce what might be happening at Brown Mountain on a miniature scale. This tube is made of clear acrylic, and we have a primary electrode and a secondary electrode. What makes it most interesting is that we have this array of third electrodes here on the side, and they reproduce some of the angles that we get from the slope of Brown Mountain to see how these interactions might come together 
and give us some type of an interference pattern that makes something like ball lightning hover in the middle of that tube. And so we have this hooked on a vacuum pump. The reason we've done that is because we cannot recreate the amount of voltage happening in Mother Nature at Brown Mountain. So to compensate for that, by taking some of the air out of here, the voltage we do have will become enhanced and act more like it would in nature at higher voltages. We have a DC power supply. This power supply is going to be producing about 1200 volts of DC, 10 to 25 milliamps, and it's going to take it a second for us to reach our maximum vacuum we need for this experiment, which is about two millitor worth of pressure. I'm going to apply some voltage. If we were looking at, say, a cliff on Brown Mountain, this bottom wire would represent one discharge coming from a shelf of earth. The top wire would represent the atmosphere, which has its own charge. The third wire would represent another charge coming from another spot on the cliff that happens to intersect with that original charge. It's that intersection that gives you the spin, that gives you what looks like a blob. So we're looking at a representation of the atmosphere and two shelves of the Earth. Right now you can see a plasma ball that's hovering between these three electrodes. And we have created this by reproducing many of the conditions at Brown Mountain. Therefore, we think that a Brown Mountain light is very similar to the type of plasma that you're seeing that appears to be hovering in the middle of this tube, but actually is just part of a much larger electrical system. Plasma created in a lab does seem to appear strikingly similar to the mysterious lights witnessed on Brown Mountain. Joshua is confident he's found the answer. The moment that I saw that ball of light appear hovering between those electrodes, I understood so many things all at once that I never understood before. I think we have a lot to learn still about the way our planet works. That's why it seems to me it's valuable to try to see if we can recreate these things that happen that we cannot explain. But the brown mountain lights are so unpredictable and rare that studying them scientifically is virtually impossible. For the foreseeable future, it seems this remarkable mystery will remain weird. What? In the remote mountains of northern Mexico, a little-known tribe is redefining our knowledge of the limits of human endurance. They can run up to 435 miles, 16 times further than a marathon in just over two days. How could this be possible? Experts are attempting to uncover the secrets to their superhuman ability. Is it unique, or do we all have it? Finding the answer could change the future of medical science. Is that weird or what? Oh, I could imagine running a marathon over 26 miles. I can hardly make it around the block. Oh, yeah. Today's elite marathon runners are quite an incredible bunch. But then again, they do have the most sophisticated modern training available. Advanced nutrition programs, state-of-the-art facilities, physiotherapy, sports psychologists, world-class coaches, everything to help them push their bodies to the extremes of what's humanly possible. But what if I told you there is a mysterious and virtually unknown group of people who with no formal training can literally run circles around most Olympians. Completely normal men and women who can run the equivalent of not one, but ten marathons back to back with a hangover.
In the remote Sierra Madre Mountains of northwest Mexico lies Copper Canyon, a rugged region home to a tribe called the Tarahumara, or the Running People. The Tarahumara have inhabited this terrain for 500 years. The name comes from their superhuman ability to run superhuman distances without running shoes. How do they do it? Chris McDougall is a former marathon runner. He is astonished by the Tarahumara's extraordinary endurance. I just assumed it was a simple trick. You just do one thing and you're, and you're good to go. And then when I started to look into the tribe, I realized that this guy was not unique, that this is an entire tribe of people that can run distances well beyond 100 miles. They routinely run 200, 250 miles at a time. And not just some people, but all of them, men and women, old and young alike. There are men in their 70s and 80s who are still running 150 miles at a time. Remarkably, the tribe record for the single longest run is a staggering 435 miles in just over 48 hours. 435 miles is the equivalent of running from New York to Cleveland, Ohio. To run this distance over 16 times further than a marathon in one session defies belief. But even more remarkable is how they do it. Either barefoot or these thin homemade sandals made out of either deer skin or Whenever people like chuck old tires down in the canyons, they'll actually scamper out, salvage the tires, and cut them into sandals. So, men and women capable of feats of endurance that seem impossible, long distance runners at the very pinnacle of athleticism. So now, this is the point in the story where I'm supposed to scratch my head and say, oh my. Is that weird or what? How can the Tarahumara people be doing what they do? But perhaps the really weird thing, and the actual question to be asking here is, why can't the rest of us, normal folk, do what the Tarahumara do? I mean, why can't I run hundreds of miles at a time? What? To look for answers, let's talk to the experts. Sports nutritionist John Barati thinks that their remote environment plays an important role in their extraordinary ability. These individuals run as an integral part of their culture. They run for survival, they run for inter-village communication, and they run for sport. The Tara Humara live to run. They regularly compete in two or three hundred mile races through rugged mountainous terrain. Delivering mail, they can run up to 500 miles in a week. So you can imagine if you lived in a culture where running was the only means of athletic expression and you had to run for survival as well, you actually get pretty good at running. So how do the Tarahumara run these superhuman distances? Could diet be the answer? During a 26-mile race, an average marathon runner will burn around 2,600 calories. To endure this distance, their bodies need to consume large amounts of carbohydrates, like those found in sports drinks. Carbohydrates are stored as glycogen in the muscles and are gradually converted to energy. But on a 435-mile run, it's estimated, the Tarahumara can burn up to a staggering 43,000 calories. Where do they get this energy? Chris McDougall studied the Tarahumara diet. He was astonished at what he found. They drink like crazy, particularly at harvest time. They do a thing called tezginadas. And tezginadas are just full-on, Anything goes, drink till you die, raves. There actually serves a purpose. When you live in a culture where everyone relies on his or her neighbor, you can't afford to have grudges and resentments. So every once in a while, you need to sort of blow off steam and get it all out of your system. During harvest and before races, the Tarahumara 
consume large amounts of a corn beer called tesquino. Could this be the key to the extraordinary endurance of the Tarahumara? They actually may be increasing their hydration status and their glycogen status with this corn beer. It's very high in carbohydrate and the alcohol content is low. It's actually been estimated that it would take about four liters to get intoxicated using their corn beer or their corn beverage. So if you think about it, the amount of carbohydrates that would come with that and the amount of just simple fluid load would be very high. Amazingly, loading up on high carb beer before a race may help the Tarahumara, but this alone can't explain their incredible long distance abilities. So what is it then? What makes them so special? Well, apparently nothing. They just never stopped doing something that once upon a time, we all did. To uncover the incredible truth, we need to go back in time and delve into humanity's evolutionary history. Dan Lieberman thinks the answer might be found in humanity's shared evolutionary history. The Taramara's abilities to run really long distances really comes from our evolutionary history as hunters. We live in a world that's so different from the world for which we evolved that we have lost a lot of those abilities. Hundreds of thousands of years ago, early human hunters had to pursue their prey over long distances. They would literally chase the animals until they died of heat exhaustion. It's called persistence hunting and is still practiced by the Tarahumara today. What you do is you, you run at a speed that makes an animal gallop. Most quadrupeds, the way they cool down is by panting. When an animal gallops, it can't pant. So it slowly heats up and heats up and heats up. But we, of course, cool by sweating. So if you can make an animal, if you can chase an animal, make it gallop for 10 or 15 minutes when it's really hot, that animal will die. Evolution has provided humans with many ways to endure long distances. Were we born to run? You know, starting two million years ago, we evolved these abilities to run very long distances in order to hunt. And we have features all throughout our bodies, literally from our heads to our toes, that help us run long distances, both in terms of storing up and releasing mechanical energy, in terms of cooling, in terms of recruiting energy and storing energy. And what the Taramara have done is they've kind of kept those mechanisms and they keep developing them as they grow up. Most of us have those abilities, it's just that we don't use them. With little or no need for exercise, Dan believes our modern lifestyle is to blame. Why would you want to persistence hunt nowadays? I mean, we can go to our supermarket, we can buy our, our meat for, you know, fully packaged in a, in, a, in a container with you know, wrap all over it. And in fact, for the last maybe 50 or 100,000 years, people probably didn't have to do that very much because of the invention of the bow and arrow. So, so this kind of hunting is probably very ancient and has become much less common probably over the last 20, 30, 40, 50,000 years. Nobody's exactly sure when. So it turns out that the Tarahumara are just doing what any of us was designed to do by evolution. Run. Our bodies were honed over hundreds of thousands of years to be the perfect long distance endurance machine. But what use is having such a formidable tool if you don't know how to use it properly? You see, there is still one crucial thing that separates them from us technique. When we started studying barefoot running and minimalist shoe running, we learned that there are some interesting aspects to the way that Tarahumara run that may be actually of some use to us. The Tarahumara don't use conventional running shoes. They run in thin homemade sandals called huraches, or they run completely barefoot. Could this be the answer to their superhuman abilities? Sports scientist Dr. Irene Davis suspects that because the Tarahumara run without shoes, they run differently than most modern marathon runners, and that this may be the key to their amazing endurance. It's time to put this theory to the test.
We're gonna start you up and we're gonna have you walk just to okay. kind of get you warmed up and then we'll break it into a run. And I want you to just land your natural type of a landing. Okay. We're gonna collect some data with you running naturally. Wearing running shoes, the test subject lands on his heel first, then the rest of the foot connects. In runner's terms, this is called a heel strike and has long been considered the ideal running style. But the experiment's results offer a different perspective. This is a skeleton depiction of you running. Okay. And that red arrow is actually the ground reaction force as it goes through your heel and through your foot and actually up through your center of mass. Over here on this graph, what you're seeing is this is the ground reaction force as you land. What's interesting about this is that you've got a very distinct impact peak. This impact is the, the area that we think might be related to injury. Okay. Okay, so you can see that with each foot strike, you get this impact peak. Okay. Okay. The test suggests that when we run in shoes, there is more impact on our legs and feet, increasing our chance of injury. And that's because the extra support running shoes provides actually prevent our muscles from doing their job properly. The shoes are over supportive, then the muscles aren't working so hard. And if the muscles become weak, then you're going to have a greater tendency to get injured as well. But is there a difference when the subject runs in bare feet? So Jason, are you thinking about the way that you're landing, or are you just letting your feet land the way they want to naturally land? I'm letting my feet uh, naturally land the way they want to land. I feel I'm um, definitely landing more midfoot, forefoot. De I mean, there's definitely less impact. Now what we're looking at you running barefoot, you can see that you're not landing so much on your heel. Do you see that you have a less distinct impact peak? I think it's, you know, it's, it's crazy that how much the, the force, the impact, how much less impact there was. In the end, it seems that Tarahumara's secret isn't a secret at all. It's their birthright. And apparently, ours too. Could we all be superhuman if we ran without shoes? Probably not. But finding the answer to the mysteries of the Tarahumara's remarkable endurance may take us a step closer to understanding the secrets of the human body. I think there's an enormous amount that we can learn from people like the Tarahumara because they teach us about how our bodies were designed to function. They teach us about basic human capabilities, right? We think, we still think it's extraordinary that they can run so far. But actually what they teach us is that it's actually normal that we can run so far. So three bizarre mysteries, yet many possible explanations. Spookiness in Death Valley. Rocks and stones moving around the flat desert floor without human or animal intervention. But how? An elaborate hoax, aliens? Or are these rocks just acting like natural curling stones? Mysterious lights spotted for hundreds of years on a US mountain. Are they the spirits of long-dead Native Americans? Are they simply campfires? Or is the mountain itself conjuring a fantastic natural phenomenon? In Mexico, a remote tribe capable of running hundreds of miles at a time. How can this be possible? Is it their diet? Their choice of footwear? Or are the Tarahumara simply doing what all our early ancestors did? Were humans Born to run? You decide. Join me next time for more stories that will undoubtedly be weird or what? <laughs> <laughs>